Amazon was solidly profitable, but it wasn't good enough for the street. All that and more on this tech edition of Industry Focus. Greetings, fools. Sean O'Reilly here at Fool Headquarters in Alexandria, Virginia. It is Friday, January 29th, 2016, and joining me to chat about several depressing earning report reports is my write-in candidate for president this November, Mr. Dylan Lewis. What's up, man? Oh, I like that. I I was th- I was sitting there. I was like, who would I? Want? I was looking around. Like, I, I don't like any. I'm gonna write in Dylan. <laughs> He'll be the only guy that gets one vote. For our listeners, Sean was very proud of the intro that he came up with today. I thought it was. And funny. I thought it was pretty good. I, I'm flattered that you would vote for me over like Mickey Mouse. Yeah. I, that, that's like no, the, I know. That's, that's the, the right facto right yeah. candidate, right? Doesn't Mickey Mouse get like I don't know, ten thousand votes every? He gets president? enough. Yeah. Or yeah, he yeah gets enough. Um, the mouse gets enough. He yeah. yeah anyway yeah um, yeah no it's, I don't know I'm thinking about doing something wacky this November anyway um, so uh, Dylan before we dive into uh, some rather sad earnings reports um, uh, I mentioned our resolution write ups which can be found on resolutions.fool.com with uh, with my show with Vince on mm-hmm. Tuesday uh, I wanted to see if you'd be willing to give our listeners just a little bit of a taste of what you wrote about yeah so as the single without child guy Bohemian in, that lives in, in the Columbia gr- in the, Heights, DC. <laughs> in the group of editor analysts in fool.com, I didn't have something heartwarming like a wedding or a saving child for a or... child or anything like that. Um, mine were all very selfish and focused on me. Uh, I think. Are you putting more money in your 401k? Uh, yes. I, Just say. Uh, one of them was up my 401k percentage. I uh, went from 9 to 12, which I took care Ooh, of already. All right. So, good. Yeah. Be- well beyond the fool's generous match policy. Um, and then I think I'm trying to think of those. I have a, an old 401k from a previous employer. I'm looking to roll that over. It has because, like $800 in it or something. Uh, yeah, it's small. I think it's a couple hundred bucks. Yeah. Uh, but the expense ratios on some of the funds that it, it's broken out into are just not Absurd. stomachable. So yeah. I need to move that over. And then lastly, um, tuck away some money in my Roth that I have been neglecting for a year or two. So, awesome. So take care of those. I will say I do have one tech related um, you know, resolution. Since, since this what? Is a tech show. Hold on. Um, oh. I currently do not own any FANG stocks. Uh, that's Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, or Google. Um, well, a bunch of them are down, except for Facebook right now. So Yeah. <laughs> and one of my reasons for not having owned them is I've always really struggled with the valuations. I mean, I mean, I cover tech. I should be able to st- stomach those kind of valuations. But um, one of my resolutions is to buy one of those four a companies. A FANG stock. Yes. Excellent. So uh, maybe that will be a show to come in the future, which one I choose, why I choose it. But, which FANG? All right. Cool. Yeah. Um, all right, so diving in, I guess we're going to do Apple first? Yeah, let's, Sound let's good? talk Apple first. Um, how do they do? Big numbers. Big numbers. Uh, so revenue came in at $75.8 billion uh, within guidance, but below analyst estimates. Earnings Dylan, cl- say it with a little respect. <laughs> 75 I'm just kidding. Yeah. It's fine. <laughs> earnings clocked in at uh, $3.28 per share, uh, beating analyst expectations of $3.23 per share. Um, obviously, the third big number that most people are looking at when it comes to Apple's earnings are iPhone sales. Um, it's really the only number. Yeah, yeah. given that anyway. it's two-thirds of their revenue base. Um, iPhone sales were 74.8 million units for the quarter, which was up 300,000 units over the previous that's year. That's not a lot. I mean, I'm not looking yeah. at a percentage, but that's not a lot. <laughs> You're not used to seeing uh, like increases of Hundreds less, of thousands. Yeah, increases what? of less than a million, right? Um, and I think that that was probably part of the problem, really. When you, I mean, we, I just mentioned it's two thirds of their Three, revenue base. Three hundred thousand is an apartment complex in China. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what is this? Uh, you know, like a city, even. Um, and so, uh, you know, despite the guidance that they laid out in the previous quarter that had um, said that there would be segment growth, obviously investors were a little worried coming into the report. Uh, there have been some kind of bearish signals from Apple suppliers, notably Taiwan Semiconductor. This is something actually we talked about when we did yeah. the IDC show yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, a little while back. And so uh, a lot of people were worried about what iPhone segment growth and just general revenue growth would look like. Uh, those concerns, obviously, somewhat valid. Uh, you know, the company did demonstrate growth, which you like to see. Um, it was not up to the street's expectations. That's why you've seen some of the dip that you've seen in the market recently. But Dylan, they beat on earnings per share estimates. Yeah. Um, that's that's kind of perennially the Apple problem, right? Is yeah. They lay out really solid guidance uh, that at least shows some sort of growth, except for this upcoming quarter, something we can get into. But um, the street always wants more from them. Okay. Um, they already own America. How are they doing internationally? Yeah. 
on a constant currency basis, Apple would have reported 8% year over year growth and an extra five, uh, that which would have amounted to an extra $5 billion on the top line. That would have been nice. Right. Um, so, and, obviously, <laughs> currencies is. Cr- I didn't Cook talk about that on the call? Like, we don't know what's going on, but the world's crazy right now with yeah. these currencies. Yeah, he, like, he touched <laughs> on it. He was like, there's just a lot of crazy stuff going on. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, that's basically the gist of it. It's like, and did you yeah. see last night Japan's going negative with their interest rates? Yeah, they're actually room, charging you yeah. to. Anyway, all right. Sorry to interrupt. Go on. No, uh, no problem. Um, and so instead, uh, due to the strong dollar, the company and investors had to settle for just a two percent bump. Uh, so I mean, you think that's six percentage points difference that um, they faced due to currency headwinds, right? Uh, looking at China, obviously one of the really big markets for them. In fiscal Q4 2015, they experienced year-over-year growth of 99 percent, which is staggering. This quarter, year-over-year growth of 14 percent. Uh, that is a. I mean, it's still growth. Yeah, but, uh, it's not white is, hot or on fire or anything like but that. But it's definitely like a pump the brakes a little bit on right. that segment. Uh, similarly, emerging markets, sixty five percent growth in fiscal Q four twenty fifteen, and this most recent quarter eleven percent growth. Did uh, everybody's worried about China hard landings all this stuff right now? Cook's still bullish on them, right? Like yeah. he's optimistic. Yeah, the general tone that we got from the conference call was we're going to continue our rollout plans. Uh, you know, I think they have the aim. I think there's something like 28 stores in China right now, retail That's locations, it? and okay. they're looking yeah. to get to something like 40. Uh, yeah. I think at some point in the next year or two. Uh, none of this has impacted those plans. They're still going to run through with that. Um, but you know, I mean, the the foreign stuff is legitimate concerns. Uh, Two thirds of Apple's revenue comes from outside the U.S. at this point. So uh, the strong dollar, while it's fantastic for them buying components and things like that, uh, does make it tough to operate in some of these foreign markets. Long term, though, that is a pendulum that'll probably swing the other way eventually. I would you, think you have to think. I mean, right. we, we're not really in the business of like macro, macro calls and uh, George Soros type things. And you know, I think one of the things we always <laughs> preach is that you can't predict, you know, which ways currencies are going to move or what's going to happen on the more global scale. But the companies that are operating well have great products. Um, satisfied customers are going to continue to operate in that way. I think that's kind of what we see here with Apple. Um, that said, uh, they have had to make some regional price adjustments. Um, and up or down? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, up um, to count, you know, to counter some. Oh, because of, of the currency, the currency okay. issues yeah. and devaluations. And so, um, you know, Luca Maestri, uh, the CFO, in some of his comments during the conference call, had alluded to the fact that. They've made some moves, but uh, you know it's possible there could be a ceiling at some point. There is a trade-off when right. you raise prices that you're diminishing demand, and so um, I think that they know that that inflection point is somewhere off in the distance. Because you're willing to pay 100, 150 bucks or whatever above like a comparable Samsung for an iPhone, but once you start getting <laughs> above that, it's like yeah. Yeah, the the brand cachet they have only offers so much price and elasticity. They're not quite Tiffany's someday. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So we keep mentioning the conference call. What was your best takeaway or tidbit for our listeners from the conference call? Yeah, I uh, I really honed in on the gross margins, and I think the reason that I think this is such an awesome thing from the conference call is something we always talk about is you can look at financial statements and you know you can make numbers look very pretty in a table, like it, it, without context or without framing for why things are doing certain things. It's very easy to just say, okay, like that looks great, and just kind of yeah. check it off. Um, and so during the rundown, um, you know, just kind of running through all the numbers, Luca Maestri highlighted the company's 40.1% gross margin for the quarter, uh, which is actually up from the previous quarter's 39.9%. Uh, that's not really zero point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 20, 20 basis point yeah. bump, but that's not really the whole story. Um, in December, uh, Samsung paid Apple 548 million to settle a long-standing patent dispute between the two companies. Naughty, naughty Samsung. And so, and this is actually something we also talked about. Um, yeah. You know, maybe in late December or something on the podcast, um, and so that baked into the top line number that that gross margin was based so on. So really, it and, didn't and so grow. more of an operational metric, and this is something Maestri talked about uh, after being pressed on it from one of the analysts that covers Apple. Um, that 550 million figure uh, contributed something like you know a 40 basis point change in gross margins. So. The more accurate gross margin number on a product side is closer to 39.7 percent, and um, that's mm-hmm. actually down mm-hmm. both sequentially and year over year. And so, uh, you know, anytime you see that 40 40 percent like uh, gross, gross margin, margin. Number, like that's pretty gaudy, right? right. And like that's something that Apple is yeah. going to play up. Um, that's not a sustainable number here. And I think when you look at what they've guided for for the next quarter, uh, somewhere between 39 39.5 percent, that just reinforces the fact that. 
that's closer to where the real number is. Got it. So uh, I love that, particularly just because it showed uh, how great getting into the weeds on the conference call can be and how valuable it can be for investors. Uh, given Apple's bank account of $150 or $180 billion, do you think they bothered cashing the $548 million check? I think they did. You think? Immediately. Okay. Like, <laughs> maybe played a game with it or something? I don't know. Yeah, and I think I think those cash reserves... Um, we're somewhere in the neighborhood of like 213 million, something yeah, like that, and know. then like 93 percent of that is held overseas at the moment. Oh my god! So there's there's a tax. My on- point is that 548 million dollar <laughs> check is like you and me getting a 50 dollar bill from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's a drop in the bucket, but they'll happily take it, right? right? Yeah, yeah, especially yeah. if it boosts margins. Um, last but not least, uh, before we get into Outlook, uh, what's up with the watch? Do they sell anymore? Did yeah. they sell ten more watches? <laughs> now, there's a, this is the struggle, right? I mean, there's not a lot of info on the Apple Watch. They so they're being coy about it still. Yeah, and you know, with the iPhone line, they give average selling price, which is the metric people watch very carefully, um, and they give units, so you can say, okay, this is what the revenue contribution is. It's very easy. Uh, they don't really do that aside from segment reporting. So looking at like the other the yeah. services, things like that. And so, uh, all we really got on Apple Watch is, um, as we expected, we set a new quarterly record for Apple Watch sales with especially strong sales in the month of December. <laughs> it seems like the Apple Watch is, I mean, I'm far less bullish on the watch than I was or am currently on AWS, but it seems like Apple's AWS, like they're going to be coy about it until it's big. That could like, be. <laughs> I, I think that's got to be the strategy for tech firms. I mean, we've seen several companies do that at they this just, point. You know, anyway. Um, so, how's it th- looking going forward? We're well into 2016 now. What's up? Yeah, I think. All right. So, we talked about this on the walk down to the studio. Uh, at a seven hundred and fifty billion dollar valuation, they're going to make it to a trillion, Dylan. Don't say it. <laughs> you know, like they were a couple months ago. There's only really so much room to grow. Right. Um, you know, now they're back somewhere in the neighborhood of five hundred billion, five hundred fifty billion. So they have to sell cars. <laughs> so, uh, so there's a little bit more growth available to them. I think that the crazy growth story that we've seen over the last three years, four years, is not going to be the story moving forward. That said, I mean. I, you know some of the customer satisfaction numbers they pointed to. It was like ninety-seven percent customer satisfaction for a lot of their products in the conference call um, from all these different various research firms. Uh, I think that's very telling. I mean, these like we talked about these uh, these macroeconomic factors that are impacting emerging markets. It's going to persist for a while, but it's going to be short-lived. Uh, I think. Um, and you have to love a company that has the devout following and you know nice little dividend kicker yeah. that that Apple does. I don't think they're going anywhere in that respect. Um, so I mean, I, I still like them. I own them, so maybe I'm a little bit biased here, but uh, I, I don't have any real reason to worry. Uh, cool. Do you have any thoughts? No, that's that's it. And I loved. Uh, if anybody wants to check it out, uh, what's the title of that Daniel Sparks piece? It's slipping my mind where he compares them to McDonald's. Oh yeah, I know the one you're talking anyway, about. Anyway, we can yeah. we can if you email us and you want it, we'll find the link and we'll send yeah, it to you guys. Or just Google Motley Fool Daniel Sparks and look for it. But basically, he compares the valuation of Apple to McDonald's, and it's like the world's premier tech firm, and it's valued at like forty percent less on a PE basis than McDonald's or something. Because McDonald's got a PE of like twenty, and they're not growing. And yeah, they, I mean, you, know. you, you look at it; they're what a ten right now on yeah. PE, something like that. So it extremely reasonably valued. Um, Even is that backing out the cash or not? Like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's fine. <laughs> All right. Well, before we move on to Amazon, I wanted to point our listeners to the newly redesigned Focus.Fool.com. There, you will discover a special offer to join the Motley Fool's Stock Advisor newsletter to start your year off foolishly. All loyal IF listeners have access to a special discount on Stock Advisor that works out to a hundred and twenty nine dollars for a full two year subscription. Just go to focus.fool.com to take advantage of this offer. Once again, that is focus.fool.com. And now we're talking Amazon earnings. Should we switch seats? Yeah, uh, proverbially. Not, proverbially, not because okay. I know last time we did that, Austin's gonna Austin get mad was not thrilled because we cameras. messed up all of his camera shots. Yeah. Oh, well. um, so I'll take host lead here. Uh, what did things look like for the quarter, Sean? Um, I liked it, but the Wall Street, uh, Wall Street did not. Um, I think it was down after hours last night by 12, 13%. It's down eight right now, but it's still higher than it was three months ago, so whatever. Anyway, um, net sales for the fourth quarter increased 22% to $35.7 billion, and that's, of course, up from $29 billion in the fourth quarter of 2014. 
Um, so, I mean, that's a 26% increase. Operating income for the fourth quarter increased 88% to $1.1 billion, compared with operating income of $591 million in the fourth quarter of 2014. And net income for the quarter came in at a dollar per share exactly, which, I don't know, that's kind of weird. I wonder, like... <laughs> They a little that. too round. A little too <laughs> round. What are you doing, Jeff Bezos? Um, the Wall St- Wall Street was expecting a dollar fifty five per share, hence the huge miss that anybody that goes to the internet today will see. Yes, it's being cited. But they, in the same period last year for the quarter, uh, the last quarter of the year, earned forty five cents. So this is not, you know. Yeah, this is a company that is new to profitability. Yeah, so like, <laughs> this is what they're only their eighth quarter showing gap profits for years. <laughs> if, yeah, if I'd said two years ago, uh, Amazon's going to miss a, a, a positive net income estimate by six cents, you'd be like, uh, what? What? <laughs> really? Amazon? <laughs> they're going to have a gap profit. I'm going to buy the stock. Yeah. Um, for the full year, th- this f- these full year numbers are awesome. Um, operating cash flow, which everybody you know talks about Amazon's cash flows. So that's why I'm highlighting and it. And that's really the number to look at. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, heck, gap profits are like, they're a joke for anybody, but particularly for <laughs> Amazon. <laughs> anyway, um, operating cash flow increased 74% to $11.9 billion for the trailing 12 months, compared with $6.8 billion in, uh, as of December 31st, 2014. Free cash flow for the full year was $7.3 billion, up from $1.9 billion last year. Um, and even taking out the le- uh, the lease principal payments on all the machinery and all that good stuff, uh, it still came in at $4.7 billion. So they're throwing off billions of dollars in free cash, and God knows Jeff Bezos is going to keep spending it on new initiatives and drones and stuff, but that's fine. So, anyway. Yeah. Uh, one of the more interesting notes that I saw when I read through the conference call, you know, someone was pressing them a little bit about some of their logistics efforts and those sides of the business. Did you see the photo I took of the Amazon truck? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. anyway. Um, and, you know, they were saying, like, is this something that is intended to supplant your current infrastructure and the, you know, the outside businesses that you work with and rely on? And he said, no, I mean, we want to do this so that we can handle extra capacity during particularly busy times. Right. And, um, you know, I think that having this kind of money available enables. Did he the- wink at the end when he <laughs> yeah, said that? Like, Did he like- Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it, that seems to be the plan. And right. uh, having this kind of free cash flow available. Uh, just kind of allows for those kinds of investments. It's staggering. And to be uh, to your point, um, the the Amazon truck that I took a photo of and showed around the office or whatever, um, it was there on a Sunday, which you know the postal service isn't running, and they still want to get me my diapers for my son. Um, and I know that they were using it because I was talking to uh, uh, Buck Hartzell upstairs, I think, and uh, he noticed that there were lots of Amazon trucks running around just playing catch up during the holidays. So. They, as of now, that's true. Yeah. Um, Prime memberships, everybody's favorite service, um, increased 51% in 2015. Wow. Um, and it, it, that actually includes 47% growth in the U.S., so it's actually slightly better overseas. Um, that's crazy, though. And and I, I don't know exactly what the stat is off the top of my head, but I think Prime members spend like threefold. Yeah. What, um, yeah. They spend standard. over $1,000 a year yeah. on average. It's, yeah. Um, AWS, uh, everybody's favorite cloud computing business that stores all my photos of the last two years of my son. I actually think I just got the count. I have like 30 gigabytes of photos and videos. Wow. It's bad. And how old is your, is your son? He's two. So Extrapolate this. I'm going to be doing a terabyte by his 10th birthday. <laughs> and plus, I mean, you get the firsts out of the way you right. know, now. And so yeah, there's some interesting stuff there. But like, he's going to be like going, doing chorus concerts, it's baseball gonna games. Like, bad. There's going to be a lot of video that's going to be taken be in the next couple of years. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Amazon, for storing my son's life. Um, the uh, that accounted for 2.4 billion of the sales, and it, uh, in the fourth quarter, and it finished the year at 7.9 billion dollars of total revenues. So that's like eight percent of the revenues because they're just over 100, I think, um, for the quarter. I'm, yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> I'm going to skip forward to this chart I have later in the notes. Yeah. Um, the, the, <laughs> Sean, Sean titled this in our outline, More on AWS. That is one pretty chart. <laughs> <laughs> AWS is operating margin. Like, I don't even know what their AWS costs are. It's just a bunch of servers in a room. I mean, stop me. It's a lot of, it's a lot of physical infrastructure yeah, they have to set like, up. Anyway. Um, and, you know, I mean, I'm sure the services that power those right. can cost some money. But, uh, yeah. And a bunch of programmers, I assume. But anyway, um, it looks like the gross margin was about 7.5% back in Q2 2014. So flash forward a year and a half. It is a 45 degree angle straight up. Uh, Q4 2015, AWS gross margin was thir- just under 30%. Wow. They built all that infrastructure, they got the customers coming in, and it's just all icing on the cake. I think the thing you have to love about 
those kind of margins uh, is it is such a scalable business. It's going to get even better. It's I mean, awesome. It, it's crazy how easy it is for them to roll that out and increase that customer base. I, I first heard about this um, that hedge fund manager he's retired now, but Stanley Druckenmiller. He was um, George Soros's general or chief trigger puller or whatever you would call him in the 90s. I saw him to give an interview on CNBC and he was talking about how much he loves Jeff Bezos and Amazon. He's like, listen, Bezos is a serial monopolist. AWS is killing it. It's so scalable and everything. And I didn't quite get what he was talking about then. because the fir- Honestly, this is like two years ago. This is the first time I heard of AWS. Right. And then, I mean, you see it here. It's like, oh my gosh, they're going to kill everybody. Yeah. And they're beating Microsoft at all this cloud storage stuff. I mean, it's it's a big deal. Yeah, they tout themselves as the best in the biz. So, so I mean, <laughs> proof's in the pudding. Um, so, uh, okay, uh, Wall Street was disappointed. Uh, some of the headline figures that a lot of people tend to fixate on on these quick briefs were disappointing. Uh, sounds like things were pretty good. What is the outlook like for? The company over the next They were you know, year pretty or two. conservative with their outlook. Um, they guided for revenues in the first quarter of about 29 to 31 billion dollars. I mean, obviously, the fourth quarter is always way bigger because of Christmas and all that stuff. Um, but they're pretty conservative. I don't, I, none of the analysis that I read seemed to imply that Wall Street was disappointed with the forward guidance. They were just mad that they missed on gap earnings and that was it. Um, but the trends that I'm seeing and the absolute dollar numbers are awesome. So, mm-hmm. so maybe the lesson here is, uh, as a company is newly profitable, there is going to be some volatility right. in what that profitability looks like, particularly if it's a high growth company that takes a lot of moonshot projects on. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I like what's going on. I mean, yeah. Anyway, um, if you're a loyal listener and have questions or comments, we would love to hear from you. Just email us at industryfocus at fool dot com. Again, that's industryfocus at fool dot com. And as always, people in this program may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against those stocks, so don't buy or sell anything based solely on what you hear on this program. For Dylan Lewis, I'm Sean O'Reilly. Thanks for listening, and Fool on!